The scripture today is from the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to pick up where we left off last week. There's a little bit of overlap. It's Mark chapter 6, 30 through 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Jesus said to them, Come away from a, to a, a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And then they went away into a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many who saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried on, their, on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he was deeply moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, Hey, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send the people away now, so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy for themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, huh, Are we supposed to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And Jesus said to them, well, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves, and he gave it to his disciples to set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all, and all ate and were filled. And they took up the twelve baskets full of leftover broken pieces of bread and the fish. Those who ate that day numbered five thousand people. May God bless and challenge us in the reading of this word. What a beautiful, really beautiful. And what a great idea. Let's talk about love. What do you think? Do you talk about love today? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, we just read this great scripture, and it's a familiar passage, I'm sure, to most of you, the feeding of the 5,000, and it's really all about love, not just love that's out there or falling in love, it's a love that's internalized, a love that's so deep in you that it just grows and just bubbles out and bubbles over you. Have you experienced that kind of love? It's a way of showing love. The disciples, listen, they just went on this journey. It was the first time that they had been out, two by two. The two of them going out on a ministry journey together. And like I said last week, we don't know if they were beat up on that journey. We don't know if they were beaten down on that journey. We don't know if they were successful and puffed up and ready for the next thing. Or we didn't know if they were ready to quit. We do know that they came back. They stayed with Jesus. They, Jesus said to them, let's just go to the boat. And I told you last week that the boat in Mark always kind of represents the church. It's their place. In fact, here's a little fun fact that you may not know. Did you know that uh, churches, have you seen church that look like the hull of a ship? That's why. That's where that came from. The boat is a metaphor for the church. So they came back. They went back with each other, stayed with one another, and decided to just talk about our experience. This happens to us every time we go out on any kind of ministry journey that we're on. There has to be a coming back and just pouring out what happened to you. What did it feel like? Where was God moving? What was God doing? What did you do in response? How did you handle it? There are a hundred different questions that are that come up when we do something for God but we have to be the ones to ask them of each other. Yes? Amen. So what happens? They come back. They go to the boat. They go to this deserted place or what they think is deser a deserted place, but people recognize them. Now people are starting to follow them, and Jesus sees them. He says they're like sheep without a shepherd. He feels 
he's moved within him deeply to do something for them. So he does what Jesus does. He sits down, he teaches them, he preaches to them, he talks to them, he ministers to them. But it starts getting late, and the disciples, still anxious to get back to that boat, say to Jesus, come on already. Let's go. Like, send them home now. There's nothing to eat here. They're getting hungry. We're going to be stuck with all these people. Jesus says, you feed them. Why would he just do that to them? I wonder that all the time. It's really hard. You know, you come back, even as a pastor, you come back and you say, uh, there's many needs that come to me every week. Oh, well, we have to do this, and we should get this finished at the church, and this ministry really needs attention. And so many times I want to say, you do it. Why? Because we're all ministers. All of us have the capacity to do it, to feed to minister, to teach, to show the love that we've been working on boiling and bubbling over, and we can express that with one another. So Jesus isn't being harsh. He's saying, look, you just went on this ministry journey. Come back. Let's put your love in action and see if this works. They freak out, as we would freak out. What do we do? Where do we get food? We don't have enough money. There's never enough money in the church. Amen? Amen? Never enough money. God says, don't look at the money. Jesus says, how much do you have? I don't know if you realize how powerful that is. What do you have? How many loaves do we have? Jesus is speaking of loaves of bread. But when we say, how many loaves do we have, what are we talking about? Our own resources. How many gifts do we have within this congregation to do ministry? How many people have been brought here by God with specific gifts for ministry? This is something that we marvel at all the time, especially in leadership team meetings or one-on-one -on -one with, with uh, ministerial staff. How how? Miraculous is it that God brought all of these people here with such specific gifts? And if you're sitting there right now thinking, he brought a lot of other people, but not me. I don't have specific gifts. You're mistaken. You have also been given specific gifts. Jesus is just empowering them to use them. You do it. Go find out how many loaves we have. What are the ministry opportunities that are going to be presented because of the gifts that are in this place? So the disciples come back with a report. Five. We've got five loaves. Oh, and we have two fish. Now, if Jesus were a regular pastor and probably all the disciples are sitting around going, this, it's not enough. Because that's what we always do. We look at the resources that we have, and instantly we say, that's not enough. And I don't care if it's whether the bank book at home, or the food on the kitchen table, or the resources in First Baptist Church. We always look at what we have, and we worry, and we say, we don't have enough. Amen? That, that poem, that piece of the, of the Robert Frost poem today, talks about making the choice. He actually makes the choice. After he stands, looking at both roads, and looks all the way down as far as he can, and then he can't see around the bend of what's going to come, he finally decides to make a choice. He picks one. Is it better than the other? No, but he picked one. I don't know how many times we stand exactly where... The, the traveler was in that poem, looking down, looking around to what we can't see, looking at one road that looks absolutely impossible, one lo road looks impassable. None of them are easy. And all we say to ourselves is, I can't do it. It's impossible. The disciples say, five loaves, two fish, impossible. We look at how much money is in our account, or did. Impossible. We look at how many people come to church. How can we do? Impossible. God is a God of the impossible. 
God is a God that always takes us down a road that we don't know what's going to happen and for all intent and purposes looks impossible or impassable. And then God says, you do it. The choice for us is whether or not we actually take a step. It doesn't matter which road you pick. And that's one of the reasons that I use this Robert Frost poem, because it's so misinterpreted as if one is better than the other. But in the, even in, this, in the little phrase that we saw, it said, I picked one, I left the other just as fair. Just as fair. It doesn't matter what road you pick when God is calling you, because God will lead. And guess what? If it doesn't work out, and if you get to a place where there's brambles and there's really too many weeds, if God doesn't put an ax in your hand or somebody with an ax in your hand to get through that, then guess what? He's going to make a different way for you to get through. And if you can't get through, you can come back and go on the other road. It doesn't matter because God is always with us. Amen? I was telling Howard earlier that we used to, I used to work with a co-pastor. There were, there were three of us, and one of the pastors wouldn't, just wouldn't move until he heard exactly clearly from God. And he used to say that over and over. I don't know if we should do this or not. We have to hear clearly from God, clearly. It has to be crystal clear, and I have to see God, and I have to hear God leading us. Well, after a couple months of that, the rest of us were like, we got to go. So finally, it just, you know, at some point, you have to at, take one step. If it's the wrong step, it's okay. There are no wrong steps with God because God is in our steps. God has ordered our steps. Yes? I don't know. You know, you, Nevin and I were sitting up there and we were thinking, there's a lot of people here. How many people here? And sometimes that's a great thing because we know that the church is growing. But sometimes it's also a little bit overwhelming. Am I going to be t able to take care of all these people? Am I going to be able to keep up with everybody? Am I going to be able to fill out all of the administrative stuff that needs to be due, plus take care of pastoral counseling and take care of pastoral needs and see people in the hospital and preach and teach? And I haven't done a Bible study in a long time. And I can get overwhelmed with all of that stuff. You know what wakes me up? When I open my eyes and look at all of you. And I know that God has given all of you, all of us, the same gifts to be able to go and propel this place to do the work that God has called us to do. And look at all the people who are stepping up into ministry opportunities. That is a microcosm of what will happen. Don't look at how many fish you have. Don't count the loaves. Just start handing it out. Once you start handing it out, God multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies, and we never run out. We never run out because God never runs out. And until our last breath, we follow. Until our last breath, we hand out. Until our last breath, we talk about love. God bless you this morning. We are going to move into a time of communion now, which I think, I don't know, you know, it's a baby dedication. It's world communion. We're celebrating. We're doing all of these lovely things together as a community. And, uh, and then I looked over here at this little pedestal where my stuff is because, you know, we don't have the communion table set up so that I can move freely and I can, I think sometimes we box ourselves in, don't we? I think sometimes with um, structure and tradition and things that we were taught that we have to do or have to fill out or have to check off before we can either take communion or go to Sunday school or be baptized or the simple truth is God calls us just as we are. The simple truth is God doesn't 
It doesn't matter if we're taking communion with a giant table and a chalice and a bread and a stunt loaf and all of those things that we have on the normal communion table or this convenient little recyclable plastic cup. Why? Because God only tells us, celebrate. Celebrate my love. Celebrate with one another. It doesn't matter if you're doing it with communion elements or one another breaking bread at someone's house. I'm among you. When two or more are gathered, I'm among you. And so the night that Jesus was going to be betrayed and was betrayed, he made an effort to give his disciples a way that they could remember That grace doesn't have to be complicated. That religion doesn't have to be complicated. That coming to God doesn't have to be complicated. And there doesn't have to be this fabulous act of repentance. I remember in my childhood church and the pastor would talk and talk about our sins and how bad we were and how broken we were and we were supposed to be going to a contrition act almost before we would be able to take communion so we were cleansed and confessed before we went to the table. Here's what I know. Who was at that table with the disciples? Peter was going to deny Jesus three times. Jesus knew it. He didn't kick Peter out of the room before he served communion. Judas was there. Judas was going to betray him. Jesus didn't kick Judas out of the room before he served communion. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you will do. It doesn't matter what you've confessed. It doesn't matter what you think you're forgiven for or not forgiven for. You are loved exactly as you are. Exactly as you are you are. Yes, we are sinful, broken people. Yes, we need the blood of Christ to redeem us. Yes, we are thankful for Christ's sacrifice. Can we fully grasp it? I'm not sure. Jesus knew that. So we got this instead. A simple way to remember. This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. This is my blood, shed for you. Take and drink. Remember, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Will you pray with me? God, forgive us when we think that there's a list of things that we have to do to come before you, when there's a list of things that we think we have to fill in or check off, a way of being that's more acceptable to you than anything else. Forgive us when we think that we're not living up to who you want us to be. Help us to see that the only way to really grow into the best version of ourselves is to just to accept your love and that we are loved. Help us to know that we are fully loved no matter what. Help us to know that we are in your arms of grace and that your love is inseparable from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.